thank you very much for coming and again a thank you to the Transnational Environmental Crime Project for hosting me as a visiting fellow. Uh, this talk I'm going to be doing today is actually a joint piece of research uh, between myself and you might know uh, Professor Nigel South at University of Essex and this draws on some of his research from several years ago and then research that I've conducted as well. So what I'll be doing is comparing these two black markets, wildlife trafficking and drug trafficking. How I'll lay this out, first I'll talk about the methodology of how we actually ended up comparing the two different black markets. Also, why we bothered, what, what, what is it about drugs and wildlife that can, we can learn from each other or what does one have to, to speak to the other about? Then I'll get into the bulk of that data, so the overviews, if we look at the, the facts around drugs and wildlife, what, what do they look like? How are they similar and how are they different? And then our findings of, of what we found from this. So the methodology, as I said, draws on, on two pieces of research. It first drew on, on my case study research that I conducted in Russia Far East. And that was two case studies, as Ben mentioned, one of falcons and one of fur. And how I collected the data for these case studies was, was in three ways. The first thing that I did is that the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, more commonly known as CITES, has a very thorough, robust online trade database. So each party that becomes a member of CITES, which is about, and, I think it's 178 countries now, they have to report every year about all legal trade to the secretariat that's in Geneva. And part of that data set is also everything that they found to be illegal. So, and this is the range of wildlife. And that's what's interesting about wildlife black markets and wildlife trade in particular is how diverse it is. So it's live animals and plants, derivatives, products, and those derivatives and products take on an enormous range of diversity, uh, clothes, traditional medicines, decorative objects, carvings, bark, teeth, that, the list goes on. But all of that gets reported to the CITES Secretariat and we can all access this database online for free. So that was the bulk of the data. And then also a content analysis of newspaper articles. And this was both in English and Russian languages to see what in the Russia Far East they're actually talking about. Are they reporting other kinds of wildlife that's getting trafficked in different areas? And then finally, I conducted 21 semi-structured interviews. And this was with uh, Russian experts, so local NGOs in Moscow and Vladivostok, as well as embassy officials at the US embassies, um, CITES officials, customs agents, police officers, basically anyone who would talk to me. I was trying to, to collect data about what they perceived the structure of wildlife trafficking in Russia Far East was. So based upon that uh, data, uh, Nigel and I then compare that to his research that he had uh, conducted in 1990. And you'll see that they've come up with these typologies of traffickers and we take those drug trafficking typologies and we apply them in the context of wildlife. Uh, again, why did we do this? What's the purpose of that? Well, as you might know already, there's a tremendous amount of research around drug trafficking, but possibly very little around wildlife trafficking. So we thought that we could gain further insight into the illegal wildlife trade by comparing it to drug trafficking, which is much more thoroughly researched. The intent is to contribute not only to the studies of drug trafficking, uh, but it's also its relationship with other forms of organized criminal enterprises. So do we learn something about organized crime when we look at drug trafficking, and can that teach us about organized crime in the context of wildlife? And then obviously, or hopefully, as, as many of us do, the, eight, the main aim is to try to aid in prevention tactics. If we can learn more about these, how can we actually then contribute to policy and contribute to prevention strategies to actually help, help stop these and help law enforcement and policy makers? The overviews then, so to give you an idea of, of what's happening in, in regards to these two traits. So as I said, extensive research around drugs. 
I'm sure all of us know that there's a huge literature around drugs and drug trafficking. There's very limited research, though, about wildlife, though that is changing and there, there's becoming a, a greater amount of literature. If you look at the uh, estimated, certainly estimated amounts of profits that the two black markets have, uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime estimate that the total profits at the end of the chain for drugs to be around 4 billion US dollars each year, 400 billion US dollars each year. So a tremendous, the biggest black market on the, in the planet. It's, it's incredibly profitable. Wildlife is estimated to be between 10 and 20 billion US dollars annually. And that number varies depending on who you ask and what's included. If you <coughs> were to take uh, illegal timber trafficking within this figure and also overfishing, so illegal fisheries, that number would most likely be bigger. But these are estimates based on uh, numbers that are already probably sketchy to begin with, of which I'll talk a bit about, a bit more about. And what's also similar between the two that's kind of interesting that we thought is that they're actually categorized in somewhat similar fashions. So drugs tend to be categorized uh, as far as danger on some level. So category A drugs, category B drugs, as they use in Europe for uh, criminalizing them. And then wildlife gets broken down into categories that are somewhat similar. You look at species, and so we can uh, break them down in, in somewhat similar patterns and similar ways. The stages also have a fair amount of similarity to them. So drugs to be available to the market have to be cultivated. So you have to grow the plants first, and then they have to be processed actually into the drug that's going to be sold. Most of wildlife is that way too, that you have to actually capture, kill, harvest, uh, depending on what the species is, the type of wildlife that is in demand. And then a fair amount of wildlife actually does get uh, produced or manufactured into some kind of product. There is a, certainly a live animal trade, but then there is also these uh, very big black markets of, as I mentioned, timber, for instance, has to get processed, fur has to get processed, traditional medicines, they all have to be actually manufactured into whatever the final product is that's going to be sold. So similarities there between drugs and wildlife. The way that drugs and wildlife are smuggled are actually similar as well, we found. The, the tactics that perpetrators use. Uh, the first one there, on the body. So drugs will be either ingested or just physically hidden under people's clothing. And that happens with wildlife as well, that it gets hidden under clothing. And uh, in that case, Australia has some very famous pictures that always come out in wildlife uh, trafficking discussions of of the men wearing vests that have these egg pouches specifically designed where they can smuggle out eggs or have reptiles wrapped around their legs taped to them. So they put wildlife on their body, uh, similar to, as I mentioned, drugs. Uh, people use their luggage, so just uh, actually carrying it on planes or boats and in their vehicles, using their vehicles to smuggle the drugs or the wildlife. So <coughs> This can be very elaborate, having hidden compartments in cars when you're crossing borders. But a lot of the same tactics being used. Pretty much uh, common throughout both of them, and arguably for other black markets as well, bribery is an is a integral feature to how wildlife and drugs are both smuggled. And this could be customs agents, police officers, border agents, all of these people are, are bribed to be able to smuggle these, these different articles. Where we start to see differences, though, is that drug trafficking uh, has a very particular uh, structure to it because it's never legal. Drugs are never legal. Cocaine is never allowed to be smuggled or t to be uh, transported, heroin, all of those. How that difference from wildlife is that some wildlife, it's perfectly legal to, to be transporting it, to sell it. So what happens in wildlife then is there's a lot more laundering or forging of paperwork to actually be able to do it. For instance, uh, in my work around falcons, 
it is perfectly legal to farm falcons, so you can raise them in captive bred facilities. That's perfectly legal under CITES. It isn't legal, though, to take a bird from the wild. But what will happen is paperwork about this bird being captive can just be given to a wild species that's actually been taken illegally. So this forging of paperwork actually allows wildlife to be laundered. So where it is actually illegal, it looks like it's legal because the way the, way the paperwork works. This isn't going to happen in drugs, right? You're not going to have a certificate saying it's okay for you to have that kilo of cocaine in your luggage. It's, it's always illegal. And because it's always illegal, you have this elaborate packaging. You hear about airdrops uh, um, used from Colombian or Mexican cartels. Well, they have these massive packages of drugs where they'll uh, have a helicopter or a small plane fly to where they want it to, and they'll just drop it out into the middle of the Arizona desert, for instance, in the US. So you have these very elaborate kind of smuggling things that happen with drugs. There is certainly some elaborate smuggling of live animals, but but we argue that there's, there's some difference here in perpetration because of the pure illegality of the drug trade. A bit more about the, the figures that I presented earlier. So the estimates of this $400 billion a year or how much drug, the, the actual quantities of drug that actually get uh, smuggled, these are estimates just based upon assumptions. Uh, where they get these assumptions from, where the estimates are based on, is the turnover of drugs, the amount of trade, and the profits. And what the different figures of the UNODC comes up with then is that at that first stage, at production, when it first gets sold, drugs are worth around $13 billion a year. But at the next stage, at the wholesale, when it's getting ready to go to the final buyers, it goes up to $94 billion, and then you have another increase up to around $334 billion at the final stage. And these are all based on retail values that we, with the uh, experts have gone in and estimated how much, is that, or how much it's worth at those different stages. Wildlife has similar stages. Uh, the trouble is then, though, what gets reported about wildlife is usually what the perpetrator is saying that the value of the wildlife is worth. And they don't have an interest in actually reporting actually how valuable it is. So it's based, <coughs> our estimates are based upon these customs figures rather than a market value of actually how much profit they would be receiving from selling the wildlife. Other problems with the sort of data that you get around profits and how much it's worth estimating how large it is, is the, the incredibly hidden nature of it. And this idea of who are the victims in wildlife trafficking. Obviously, wildlife isn't reported that they've been trafficked, so you're reliant upon people coming forward or it being uncovered by customs and border agents. There's also no set standard value to wildlife. What one person or one country would regard for their timber, say, isn't necessarily going to be what it's worth in another country or to other people. So without a standardization of value of wildlife, this 10 to 20 billion a year is, is really, uh, really just an estimate. And then I argue in other work as well that this doesn't also cover uh, intrinsic values that we can talk about wildlife, that this is purely a market kind of consumer focus or conception of what wildlife is worth. What about other value that wildlife has to us as people, aesthetic values, ecosystem services, what about the destruction to environmental places? And, and that's not captured in this kind of uh, just purely for profit kind of value that we're assigning to it. So just the two examples <clears throat> that uh, generated from my case studies. The fur trade is, is organized it, in the following way, at least in, in the Russian Far East where I collected my data. <coughs> so you have poaching with what's called indiscriminate traps. And indiscriminate traps just refers to the fact that this common bear steel trap that just lays open can catch any sort of animal. That's why it's indiscriminate. It isn't species specific. It can catch any sort of thing that steps into it. What happens then is the trapper will take that pelt of that animal and sell it to a middleman. 
What might happen, though, is that because this trap is indiscriminate, maybe he caught something that he wasn't supposed to. I say he because I don't think there's many women trappers as far as I can tell. But they then, what if they've caught a tiger, which is certainly possible in Russia, or a leopard, something that's totally illegal that they're not supposed to have. In those rare instances, the trapper can't pass it on to a middleman because there isn't a legal market for a tiger skin. What happens in the Russian Far East is if you do actually catch something that's endangered, you're very close to the Chinese border and you, you cross over into China and, and sell it there. If it is something legal though, it's a fox, it's a sable, you sell it to the middleman and the middleman <coughs> carries on selling it down the chain. So there's a huge market for fur in Russia, so all of these pelts get collected for the annual auction every year. What's found though is that there's quotas set for sable, which is the most popular fur in Russia. And every year, all of us could go and look right now at the St. Petersburg Fur Auction website, the amount of fur that is sold <coughs> exceeds the set quotas. So there's illegal tracking going on there as well. Even though it's legal to take sable, more sable than is supposed to be taken is taken every single year. So there's illegal blended in with the legal as well, even in, the le in these uh, very prestigious for auctions. And then as I mentioned in the, in the third point, the selling on the black market. If you catch an endangered species, it's got to go to the black market. It can't go into the, into the legitimate fur industry. Structure very differently then though, if, if you look at falcon trade, which is a live trade. Uh, people in the Middle East, uh, and others argue also in the Far East in Japan, where falconry is still practiced, so using falcons to hunt. It's a very popular sport still in those countries, in those areas. So there is this demand for live birds to, to participate in this activity. How that happens then, though, is you need a very specialized person, an ornithologist or someone with an a, a intricate knowledge of, of birds, to actually go and collect eggs or capture young birds out in the wild. So it becomes a very uh, specialized kind of task. And particularly, it isn't just someone will go out and collect eggs. It usually looks like uh, it's filling a specific demand. So if someone wants a bird, and they've asked through their network, and it gets funneled to this ornithologist who then goes out and actually takes, takes the egg or takes the young bird. The dealer then picks it up and transports it uh, these really long distances. So traditional falcon falcon uh, range used to be in Central Asia, but most of the populations there have been completely decimated. So the last sort of remaining populations are in Russia in very remote regions in the Far East. And so you have this epic kind of transport going on, of thousands and thousands of miles of the bird getting from Far East Russia into the Middle East. And this is usually happening by trains, boats, or planes. But key to that, as I mentioned before, is bribery. You need to be bribing customs officials along that route, or you need to be bribing transportation people along that route so that the train employee or the uh, airline employee will let you take something on that's illegal. So how they differ then, the, the fur can be very individual, it's opportunistic. You might take more than you're allowed to while you're out there or accidentally uh, kill something that's endangered. It goes through the middlemen into the industry, so it gets laundered into a legal uh, business most of the time, though there is that uh, black market that I mentioned of endangered skins. Falcons then, it, it takes on a different structure. It's very specialist, it's very planned. Uh, dealers smuggling along very specific routes of, of one location to the destination location. And the experts that I talked to argued that organized crime was involved in this. And they didn't think that it was the actual, the Russian mafia, so to speak, but they argued that it was more organized crime coming from the Middle East that would organize the, the actual uh, transportation route and the smuggling route. Uh, again, that's all very anecdotal. The, there isn't any really hard evidence around that, but the, they do think that organized crime uh, facilitated this simple chain network of smuggling. How then uh, does that compare to what previous research around drug trafficking actually showed? 
So Nigel uh, and his colleague uh, Dord argued back in 1990 that there's two sets of uh, categories where you could break down drug trafficking, and that was multi-commodity uh, actors that are involved and then specialist actors that are involved. And part of the multi-commodity, they argue, are these business sideliners, as they call them. So you're involved in dealing drugs, but it's not your main business. You do it as part of other illegal activities. And we found that that fit very well with the fur trade that I just described, that uh, it isn't your main intention or your, your purpose to be engaged in illegal black market behavior, but you might do it as a sideline to other legal activity that you're actually involved in. So business sideliners is one that we felt uh, you could see correlation to between drug trafficking and wildlife trafficking. Also in the multi-commodity uh, actors, you have the criminal diversifier. So someone who's involved in drug trafficking, it's argued, and you see in a lot of the literature, it's a very rational choice. You make a lot of money from selling drugs, so it's an economic choice that you engage in particularly for the profits. Where we saw correlations there is you do see drug traffickers that are actually moving into wildlife and arguably for the same kind of rational economic reasons. And we see this mostly uh, coming out of other literature, not from the research that I did, but there's uh, quite a few reports coming out of Brazil in particular where customs agents estimate there that around 40% of all drug seizures actually have some amount of wildlife in them. So you have uh, what they're arguing is clear evidence there that the drug traders are making this very rational economic choice to, to diversify and get involved in other kinds of black market profits. You also have the irregulars in the multi-commodity actors. And these are what I refer to uh, for wildlife as the indiscriminate trapping. So it's an opportunistic kind of thing rather than an intent or, or, or specific purpose. You also see that in drug trafficking at the street level where there's market opportunities. You aren't necessarily intending to be a, <coughs> a street corner drug seller, but the opportunity arises, uh, it's profitable, so you might take advantage of it. So again, opportunistic irregulars where, where you might have the opportunity to make uh, um, money in an illegal fashion. As I mentioned then, that, uh, South and Dorm break down the actors from the multi-commodities that I mentioned and that there's also the specialists. People that are involved in drug trafficking, or as we argue, wildlife trafficking, for very specific reasons. And in this case, uh, you could see that for the smuggling to order for the wildlife, that a person in the Middle East has a desire to have a very particular kind of falcon, and they use their network to have that order placed. In the drugs, you see that in, in friendship networks that often uh, help to perpetrate drug trafficking, that it's the people that you know that you facilitate that through. It isn't necessarily a, uh, um, you're not dealing with strangers ever, you're dealing with people that you know. So it's a very specialist kind of thing. You know where to get the particular drug you're going, or that you'd like, so you use your friendship networks to actually obtain it. Trading charities is another of the categories that South and Dorn present, and it's this quasi-ideological commitment. So there are people that are using drugs because they believe everyone should be allowed to use drugs and that they will use marijuana for instance regardless of its illegality and they're not doing it as some resistance only doing it because it's illegal but they're doing it because they think it should be legal and that they're going to continue using it anyway we argue that you can see the same in wildlife in the fact of around traditional medicines, that people, um, particularly Eastern cultures, that believe uh, that traditional medicines are valuable in terms of health and in curing certain illnesses, they do so out of an ideological commitment, that it's a, it's a cultural choice to actually engage in this kind of behavior. So they're not doing it again because it's illegal, they're doing it because it's something that they actually believe in, so that there's, there's a different motivation behind it there. The, the illegality is, is, is a bit of just a, a, a side effect rather than the purpose. 
South and Dorn also had two other categories that we didn't necessarily find uh, correlations to in wildlife. They have retail specialists, so shops that are particularly for that, uh, for selling drugs, that you go there because you know that that's where you're going to get it. You might be able to sort of see this in traditional medicines, uh, but even traditional medicine stores that exist um, outside of the East, those are fairly well regulated and you, it's, it's difficult to know if there are black market products in those kinds of stores. And the second one, we're not sure if, if there is a correlation, is state-sponsored traders. Uh, so you do have some governments um, in narcotics and drugs in particular that are actually facilitating drug trade on some level, uh, providing the infrastructure or at least not cracking down on it. And I have a question mark there around Cambodia and illegal logging. There's been reports uh, by the NGO Global Witness several years ago that it's actually the Cambodian government that gives uh, the logging licenses to particular friends of the family or different uh, organized crime groups, but these logging permits are in areas that are actually protected forests. So it's argued that the Cambodian government is the one that's facilitating the illegal logging. Um, so that could be state-sponsored. Again, that's um, not so much anecdotal. There's fairly good evidence for it, but uh, uh, further research has to be done to really to cement those kinds of ties if they're, they're facilitating it. So other findings that we developed around uh, the two black markets is that the possible increasing connections between the two and uh, Lorraine Elliott here uh, that's running the tech project uh, has talked about parallel trafficking of not only drugs and wildlife but other black markets that you see using the same smuggling routes or using experts that know uh, the different networks using them to, to traffic different kinds of products. There's also evidence coming out of uh, Chatham House, so the Royal Institute of Affairs in uh, London, so Heyman and Brack study that drug trafficking is actually funded by illegal logging. So the connection there being the profits that you're making off of illegal wildlife can be actually funneled into drug trafficking and drug trade. And then also another study there by Putnam Nelson showing that seasonal drugs and wildlife, so uh, when your animal that you're poaching isn't in season, you'll turn to drugs and, and vice versa. So it's actually just a very physical kind of cyclical thing that you'll be doing drugs, drugs or wildlife. Uh, we talked about um, expanding this, so what's known about wildlife has been so limited, but has increased, so I think we could revisit this and, and look at other kinds of wildlife and fit them into the structure. And we talk about looking at other frameworks. What about illegal timber or fishing uh, in comparison to drug trafficking? And what about illegal wildlife trade in urban areas? That might be a better comparison to drug trafficking since drug trade actually occurs in urban areas. Other comparisons and ties we might look at, human trafficking obviously, there's uh, again anecdotal evidence that that, though, that that is blended in as well, that as humans are being trafficked, wildlife or drugs can be trafficked with them. And then a fairly, uh, well, the funding of terrorism and militias, and this has kind of gained a bit of prominence in the last, I would say, two years, studies coming out that they do think that wildlife in particular, ivory, uh, some illegal logging might actually be used by terrorists uh, as a way of gaining funding so that they can buy arms or, or fund their militias. So some ties there for the research that might be, might be interesting. What we really would speculate at the end, though, is, is what can we learn from the fight against the drug trade, right? The war on drugs. And very recent reports have, have talked about that maybe most of the world would agree it's, it's probably a failure. So how, what can we learn on how we've uh, attacked this drug problem? What can we learn in, in trying to deal with wildlife? Uh, so the, the move in, in the war on drugs, the discussion sometimes revolves to should we decriminalize it? And then the discussion turns on wildlife, should we also decriminalize the trade in some wildlife? And that's an ongoing debate and just within 
uh, just last month in March, the CITES has its convention that happens every few years, and the discussion always turns to, should we allow trade in ivory or rhinoceros horn? Will that actually decrease the amount of crime that's associated with it? So there's this ongoing debate of what can we learn around decriminalizing different trades. What we have seen, what's clear uh, coming out of a, a study in 2009, is that for instance, if we turn to the US, if you look at the amount of resources dedicated to fighting both of these, the Drug Enforcement Agency has 5,000 agents in the US. That's how much effort they have put into the war on drugs. The US Fish and Wildlife Service, though, which is the only agency that really deals with wildlife trafficking, excuse me, only has 200 agents. So there's an incredible amount of resource uh, differential there which says something about priority, that we're very concerned about drugs, not necessarily so concerned about the illegal wildlife trade. And also what we can look at in terms of, of drugs versus wildlife is, is the punitive nature of how we've gone with drugs, giving huge uh, jail sentences and uh, fines. Is that the way to go? Is that how we should be approaching wildlife, which currently has very little punishment small fines that are argued don't deter people from actually trading it. So I would argue, no, we shouldn't go the way that we've gone with drugs, which is incredibly punitive and has created this huge jail culture. But maybe it's not where we're at in wildlife either, where we have very limited penalties. And, and these are some of those final thoughts from, from the research that we did. Thank you.